Linux OTC. Welcome to episode 24. I'm Bill. I'm Eric. And I'm Leo. We're going to talk about food. We're talking about food. We were talking about food before the introduction. I thought, ah, let's let's keep that energy because I'm going to be down here all day doing shows and I'm going to get really hungry. But I'm on a new medication, so I can't eat much. I've got to stop being fat. Ozempic. I'm getting geared up for Ozempic. The insurance I've got won't pay for Ozempic until I've been on metformin for a few months first. Mm. So we're starting with that. Metformin is not an easy drug at first because it's got some some side effects that's let's let's test the limits of the drug bill after this you gotta go like, to, to mcdonald's and then just oh. one of everything and just one of the things that work. drug will do if you overeat because it part of the way it works is it slows down the emptying of your stomach oh no and like literally takes sugar out of your system puts it into your urine sends it right out of your body that's kind of cool and I lost four pounds in the first five days of using it. So apparently, all of my weight is from sugar. Uh, well, that's why you're so cute today. Yeah, that's why my skin is vibrant. Do you eat candy and stuff, though, or is it just in your food? I, I, I As a rule, I don't eat candy, but I do have a couple weaknesses. And when I'm on the road, I don't pay attention as well as I should because you just sometimes when things get hectic you end up eating what you can when you can and it come on man you got a you got a mileage log over here you just have the caloric log over here mm, yeah if if only so we're getting aggressive with it I, I can't go into my 60s being overweight and having to deal with all of the extra issues that go along with that because the the cdl physicals are getting more and more difficult to pass if you're dealing with obesity related issues um i just don't want to deal with it and i have to live i've got small children even at this age i've got small children so i gotta live to be at least 100 you probably not (laughs) that's the goal man (laughs) that's the goal isn't it yeah because your work will never be done (laughs) i'm still waiting I'm still waiting for the vampire to find me in the dark alley. You know what I mean? Right? I'm like, you know what? Right? Just do it, dude. I'm yeah. ready. <laughs> no, but I do feel that way. I feel like I got to go above and beyond a little bit because I've got, well, I've got a 10 year old and here I'm, I'm going to be 51 next month. And, you know, I should be done with all this, but I'm, I'm right back in the middle of it all again. Yeah. So I kind of feel it's not the, the worst on all excuse that. though to improve yourself, right? I mean, I I know for me, that's given me a lot of strength through just dealing with adversity and, yeah. you know, not that it's like uh, you know that I'm that altruistic. I certainly do a lot of things selfishly, and I'm not the best person I could be. But at the same time, like, you know, uh, I remember when I was diagnosed, like you have that initial, like fear of mortality and then like five seconds later i was like nope i gotta be around because i've got a young kid and i've got my life and my wife and all this stuff to live for like you know and it immediately just kicks in and you have this i i don't think anyone could have explained to me what being a parent meant until you know i was one and like the the even though i am still like selfish to some degree in some aspects of my life like Little things like, you know, I give her extra, uh, this is so dumb, but like if we're having a really good meal that we're all enjoying, like she'll eat so quickly and enjoy it so, so thoroughly that I'm like, would you like a little bit more? You know, and like, I'm, I'm so freely giving of just like, you know, and I'm, I'm usually not like that. Like, I think I'd like to think that I'm a nice person, (laughs) but but I'm as selfish and, you know, motivated by my own, you know, little greeds and things but not with her you know not with with her it's just she has an open pass and she only slightly abuses it (laughs) yeah like they talk about love languages and i guess uh cooking is one of mine and i do the same thing man i do the exact same thing like i i I keep all the the crap bits for myself I, i eat those at the stove and then i only give out what i think is you know the best parts fit, of fit for yeah. her. Yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. And it's really hard to say no when she's like, oh, could I get some more of what you made? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, you, yeah. you can. You can. Sure. Yep. Yep. Of yep. course. I, 
I've got one daughter, and she's the 10-year-old. The other four are all boys. So she's the one with me. She is 100% aware of the fact that she has me wrapped around her finger <laughs> and that she is the princess. And I don't want to say she abuses it, but she's... Takes advantage a little. She's been known to take advantage because you... Uh, there's something about that one that's all by herself, you know, and I don't know if uh, there's things that I've given her that I might not, especially the two older boys that are like in their 30s now. Um, they had it a little bit harder because they had the they had the younger, more paranoid me. When you're that's the thing. There's a difference between young parents and old parents. I see now when you're young, everything is a drastic they, everything is life and death. You spend the most money on the stupid crap, like the fancy bottles to feed them when they're babies, and <laughs> and uh, the, the the best formula and all that. And then by the time you get in your forties, ah, just go to Dollar General and get what you need. And maybe, maybe I'm just a little different. I bought the expensive bottles, but not because I think she needed them, but because I wanted to see how they worked. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there you go. It was a it was a selfish purchase. I know how they all work now. I've tried every one of them. Yeah, all the same. You find <laughs> yeah. that out pretty quickly. It's it's mostly a gimmick. I mean, the the oh yeah. Some of the concepts are sound, but it's mostly yep. a gimmick. Um Yep, you know, babies and little kids in general, they don't need half of the stuff we think that they do. You know, they're they're happy and content with simple things. It's like uh, you know, I would go and get what I thought would be the most, you know, engrossing, amazing toy in the world, and she'd still be playing with like, you know, like something that the she box found. it came in exactly. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's oh, that's like, that's why I prefer cats. You know, cats are like kids, man. Like they'll they'll they want to do their own thing, and then if yep. you try to make them do the thing that you think they should be doing, they're absolutely not going to be doing that. So yeah. you know. Yeah, yep. you just you you you're there to provide the support, man. You're IT for living, and they'll figure it out eventually. Oh boy, speaking of IT. Okay, so you said something about Docker earlier. Um, we're gonna dissect this. Right. So one thing that um, the one thing about Midcast. Um, Around about the time I came on the show, there was about three or four unfortunate things happening at the same time. We were losing our uh, web hosting that we had been getting for free for I don't know how long, Leo. Why were uh, we losing that? I don't remember. No idea. It was it, it, something to do with um, Josh not having anything to do with it any, anymore. Oh, and, okay. So, yeah, yeah, I, I do remember that. Um he was busy and it was um it was a situation where like the site was down or something but you know he's busy so uh he didn't have uh quick access to be able to get into it and bring it back up whenever it needed that kind of tlc right um so i think the group decided that it would just be best to figure something else out i don't know that there was a time limit attached to it or anything well like that, it was but... not getting paid and the... yeah oh, that's right that's right. It, but we had credits, though. That was the thing. It wasn't even a, like, it wasn't a money thing. It was, uh, we had credits in the pool, and the company was not taking our own credits out of the pool to pay for it. And then they were kind of like, hey, you're backed up. But you could see we had, like, 50 bucks in the credit pool. And so it was kind of a, a weird situation that needed to be addressed, but, meh. It was, it was weird. And then, uh, yeah, my okay. So the first thing I did was I attempted to transfer all of that between between Josh and I. I'm I'm recalling all this as we speak. Yeah. Um, transfer it into an well my account, which I didn't have an account with Bit Bitmark Bitemark, Bite but I yeah. I made an account and it was a royal ball ache to get that transferred <laughs> into my name. Um, because they just yeah, security 2fa all that garbage um and then they did <laughs> it all started over again when i tried to put my payment method on there and then my bank was you know because it was overseas bite mark is over in the uk or whatever so that was getting to be a nightmare and it was it was about there was a couple weeks there where we had no website because it was all 100 percent 
and I I didn't get I should have, but I didn't get the backup from the uh, plugin that we used to back up the website. I should have got a copy of that. Got it yeah. paid, got it up and running just long enough for me to get the you know the WP Vivid backup off of it, and then spun it down, um, put it on Linode. That was fine for a while, but I mean that was costing money. The five dollar Linode was crashing left and right with that website. It just couldn't keep up. I put it on a pro, on a Pi four, just using uh, a bare metal lamp stack, and that worked fine. It worked fine, but uh, when I learned how to use Docker and get that up and running, it became kind of obvious because I could. Sp- Running, I'm running these two big machines anyway for other things. So, one more container running a website is really, it's it, it doesn't add any measurable. Uh, there's not much efficacy involved to it. So I did that, um, and around about that same time, Google was uh, had announced that they were no longer going to offer the grandfathered. Oh yeah, uh, Google, I remember that Google stuff. So yeah, and this was all happening at the same time. I mean, it was just we were in kind of emergency mode. Like we got to fix the website, we got to figure out an alternative for our um, documents and and audio hosting and all that. So that's when I learned how and spun up the uh, Next Cloud and figured out the whole thing with uh, getting a document server running, which. If you ever if you in if you install uh, Nextcloud, you can go to their little app store. If it if you're going to be the only one using it, or if people are going to be connected to it but not using it all at the same time, you can use the built-in Collabora server that you can get from the Nextcloud app store, and that works just fine. But when you have multiple people collaborating at the same time it falls down on its face because it's got an sqlite back end which means maybe you might get away with two maybe three people connected at the same time but that's really about it so it became necessary to spin up my own collabora instance which meant you've got your next cloud server running and then separate from that you've got another um, server of whatever type running the Collabora, which is just a web backend for LibreOffice. It provides the the uh, server functionality to keep the document server running. And it's been kind of it it works, and then it'll stop working, and it's not real clear why. And this last time it stopped and it would not start back up. Um, I first realized it, I think, Sunday night when I came down here and fired up. When I, when I bring up, when I SSH into the server, it shows me the status of my Z pool, my ZFS pool. And then it also shows me the list of all of the containers that are running. And that one was not running, which is the first red light because they're supposed to restart every time something happens right and they did not and then so i looked at the docker compose and uh restarted again and it showed running but nextcloud could not connect to it and this went on for a few days and then finally i said well i think i'm just going to give up on docker compose for those of you that are not aware when you're running docker containers uh, you've got two ways of starting up spinning up a docker container you can just use the run command which is basically a command line with uh switches and everything just like any other command line or you can use docker compose which is a yaml file that is helpful if you have to combine other containers together or if you need to um, declare a whole lot of different settings at the start time like if you're gonna if you're gonna spin up a wordpress instance for example set up a wordpress site it's best to use a docker compose because then you can declare that you also need a maria db and a php and all that 
uh, and then you can set up all the parameters for each one of those right in the Docker Compose, and then each time it sets up the, the uh, container, all that information is right there. Yeah, you can for, think about it like a script, right? Yeah, it basically is. It tells the it it. It's like uh, pre-assuming or or uh, I don't There's know pre what configurations, right? Pre-configuration with containers that are comparatively more simple to set up, meaning that there's less um, options uh, overall. Um, sometimes they don't even put Docker Compose into the documentation, and Collabora is one of those. It's basically just got a Docker run, um, I don't know, tac tac port, you know, 9980, tac, tac. And you can take that, though. You can take those options and then stuff it into a Docker Compose. Though. Well, that's what I was doing. Ah, okay. And then you would you would have that exact same command, Docker Composized, and then run it, and then it might work, and then they'll do an update, and then it doesn't work anymore. But you take that exact same command, and you put it into a regular Docker run command, and it works fine. Hmm. That doesn't it doesn't make any sense, but apparently where you there's the com where are you where are you pulling the uh, the command from directly from Calabra or yeah well from their uh, image that's on Docker Hub right but like I said in there most of the time for images or for uh, Docker stuff there that's made to work with docker compose they will put a docker compose in their documentation mm. collabora does not offer anything like that to be fair though it's not a very long you can you could actually script the uh, docker run command as well and there's not much i mean as far as extra information to put in it really it was just a, a couple of environment environment variables to declare a username and password for the uh, the admin panel which I almost never use because you really don't have a lot of options with it um, but once I once I finally gave up on trying to make docker compose work and just use the docker run command uh, it started working all of a sudden and it, it it was it was upsetting to to no end but it kind of shows that when you go when you go outside of what the documentation says or you know what the, the way you run software if you try to run it outside of what the the original developers intended for it you may run into catastrophic problems like that huh but it is yeah. running now as good as it ever did. I know not everybody's 100% happy with it because well, it's Libre. Free, so it is. And LibreOffice it's a bit of a different animal than what you might be used to if you're uh, using MS Office or if you're using Google Docs, you know, Google Docs has done well to make people it's kind of like trying to come down off a crack or something, I suppose, where, <laughs> you know, everything else just makes you angry. You know, somebody tries to give you a cup of coffee, you swat it out of their hands, you know, that kind of thing. Can't, <laughs> I can't relate. Because, huh? <laughs> guy, I mean, guys have gotten downright angry about LibreOffice and especially the way it handles bulleting and things like that. And then I wasn't real happy with it either until I went doing a little bit of learning and found out well there's there's different ways that you handle you can set up entire uh profiles to define how the indentation and the uh oh the line spacing the the distance between characters i mean everything is kind of outlined in uh in a profile and if you've got a document where several people worked on it like like the mintcast docs are and they've they've used several different profiles i mean it's visible it's visibly different looking when you kind of spread it out and look at it from a distance hmm. is this is this the only office document server no there is also only office but as far as i can tell and i'm going to do a little bit more research into it because i know the guys would like to use something else um you've got the same concept where you install only office 
connector is what they call it, the OnlyOffice app, and then you've got to have a server backend. But I think in the case of OnlyOffice, you've got multiple server backends. Okay. Because there's uh, there's one that handles, and I, and I could be wrong about this, but I, I just couldn't get it running with just one back-end server. Mm-hmm. And it seems as though there's a document server back-end, and then there's a community server back-end to provide the right. ability to collaborate in real time. Mm-hmm. And I don't know that only Office would be any more usable or not. I know that... Well, it's we more would like popular. To... When I type in Calabra on Docker Hub, uh, that's the first document editing thing that actually comes up. It'd be Calabra slash code, C-O-D-E, okay. Calabra Online Development Edition. And that's the other thing. You're, we are using the Development Edition, which means in order to use it for free, uh... we are riding the lightning as far as development goes. You, know, you like, don't have to update, right? You well, can find you, a stable one and then just stay for a while. You could, yeah. But yeah. like Don't in my case, <laughs> I'm running Watchtower on these okay. machines, which is itself a Docker container. And what it does uh, is it watches these containers. And when there's updates. an update Stop to it. the... Stop so it. I, You're making it complicated. I mean, this there's something... I, I, I wish I wish there was a way to get into... To, uh, Watchtower and define which containers to watch and which ones not to. I, okay, I would. there's no way that you can't do that in Watchtower. There's no I, way. They're not. They they they're not mentioning anything about it on the page. All right, their, then throw Watchtower away and do a <laughs> Docker pull once a month and a do month. Not, no, wait, Calabra, listen. you, you no, might wait. get. <laughs> but that doesn't matter. That's the thing. Is that like whenever you're pulling a Docker container, it's only one update technically you're pulling the entire container itself that has all yeah. of the changes right so keep whenever you find one that is nice and stable enough leave it alone don't mess with it but the beauty of docker is not in being able to leave it alone it's in being able to take those updates and when those updates break you can roll back and on top of that not only can you roll back you can actually prune off all of the containers that 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 were working right so you yeah. do four or five updates and you prune all the old ones because you're running out of space or for whatever reason just to keep it clean you can actually go back in and say specifically hey um de- prune everything and then grab only the docker container that actually worked that's the beauty of docker hub is that they have so many of those in the back not not just so many i think they just have them all you can go back years sometimes and pull exactly what you want and just keep it. And I'm sure, I haven't done it, but I'm sure in Docker there's a way to lock a container from being pruned. So, like, make it anti-prunable. And you'll always have that Docker container to fall back on when stuff breaks. And there's absolutely no way that a Docker um, main manager thing like Watchtower cannot lock one and just say yeah, it's, keep it's this there. One forever it's just, there but it's it. in the it's during the build process it says um, there's a container selection option i just stuck it in the chat for you but by default watchtower will watch all containers however sometimes only some containers should be updated there are two options you can fully exclude certain containers or you can monitor only and in this mode, Watchtower checks for container updates, sends notifications, and invokes pre-check, post-check hooks on the containers, but does not perform the update. So there's some selectivity there, I guess. And really, I mean, yeah, I mean, you're you're if you're letting it update for you, you're playing yeah. with fire, in yep. my opinion. Um, That's I not would, opinion, I would, Eric. That's fact. Yeah, this is I, because I, mean, I spend so much time on the road. I need this stuff to just. And you're right. You you're absolutely you right. You don't. Yeah. You don't yeah, exactly. need it to update. Exactly. You really don't. See, <laughs> me and Eric, we've we've been burnt so many yeah. times by this. You learn yeah. your lessons and you just let it be. And well, you know what? Some monitor is good. Reason. Monitor is good. Monitor will tell you, hey, you have you have some updates, especially if you want to then 
tie into is there a security update because that's really the only thing that's that you have to be thing. quick about everything else that's a feature update if it ain't broke don't fix it you know yep. that's basically the, the mantra um and yeah bill i'll tell you i i microsoft products in particular whenever i was dealing with a lot of them they want to you know auto update and i got burned so many times mm. by something updating in the middle of the night and i'm getting paged at four in the morning like wh i don't We're know about what's to going have on. a meeting my powerpoint doesn't launch right. anymore exactly exactly so anyway um just saying, you know, the monitor well, that's part, me. I think, is, is handy. I'm downing these containers right now as we speak. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But just don't prune. Uh, well, tell Watchtower. Uh, honestly, throw Watchtower away. But that's if, what you I'm don't, if you don't want to dive in and learn how to configure it to do exactly what we're talking about here, um, but just don't prune the old ones. And well, it's not it's not complicated. It's just basically a, another entry on the uh, Docker Compose. Okay to cool, cool, cool. to so, set that but i think for the time being i believe me i've thought about this that really there wasn't much point in running if the if the containers are running just fine when i take off on monday morning then there's no reason for the, to have that running all week and right update right. the containers while i'm not here do it when you're home on the weekends and can babysit it um, and even then, right, you're doing it to test for functionality, have everybody smack it around for an hour, and if something goes wrong, roll back. Yeah. Deal with it next week, because if you're riding the lightning anyway, there'll be another update, and then maybe that'll fix the issue. And, and that's really only if you want to stay that current. If there's not a security issue that's forcing you to update, then don't bother. Yeah. Yeah, I'll tell you what, I was managing... The only thing I had to, to manage with Docker uh, in a publicly facing way was Discourse. And Discourse, it is a beautiful piece of software, but my goodness, the back end is a frightful mess. Um, there's so much stuff happening in those containers and it is so fragile. Like every time I would update, it was guaranteed that I'd be spending hours fixing some weird bug and um and so i always <laughs> I, I never touched it until it was like okay it's been three versions now it's time to actually update and i always made a full snapshot of the system i like it took every precaution possible and it was like hours worth of effort to upgrade now a lot of you know things that are packaged in docker are not that difficult to to manage but I just always assume that an update is going to go completely awful and be a nightmare to deal with. Just having dealt with that kind of stuff in production, you know, and other systems. So yeah, when it comes to I these updates, I don't, I don't auto update. Anything. Yeah, uh -uh. <laughs> not, not on anything in the back end. Absolutely not. Um, not even on my systems. Like I just, I, you know, even my desktop. Like I just, I want to know, like, okay, even if it's just a cursory preview of like which packages are being updated you know yeah anyway. yeah Full yeah not only was i was i auto updating um i also had cron jobs set up to automatically prune once a week to everything yeah stop so it. yeah I you stopped got all dude you got terabytes of storage back there stop pruning keep keep some you don't need, and it doesn't even matter it doesn't even matter you just have to remember write down notate document what worked and then you can tell docker to just pull specifically that one you can put that in the in the uh uh in the docker compose file itself if you want to hard code it that way it does not move up um or just pull them manually and docker compose will use the the latest one i suppose yeah yeah. I mean, just hard code it in there, to be honest. If, if you don't ever want to deal with it unless it's time to deal with it, just hard code it. Yeah, because yeah. you, can, you can specify the t in the tags what you want to stick to. Mm -hmm. You know, if you want the latest or if you want to stick with the, a certain version number or anything with the first number of the version number. Yeah, I had to think about that here recently with a Raspberry Pi that's running SyncThink for me. Um, LinuxServer.io was taking care of that for me um, because SyncThing 
themselves did not have a ARM V7, I think, the 32-bit ARM, Raspberry Pi 2. They didn't have a build for that. Uh, but Linux Server I.O. did. And so I went with theirs. And it turns out seven months ago, they just stopped building them. And then so every time I would look for a latest on, um, on SyncThing, it'd be like, can't find one. And I'm like, what do you mean you can't find one? I've been doing this update for forever. Uh, and then I ran into Docker Hub, took a look, and then it turns out they just stopped building them. So there is technically no latest. It's just the one. So I had to hard Who stopped? In Linux? The one. Linux yeah. server.io? Yeah, sync thing stopped it probably years ago. Linux server IO stopped it about seven months ago. So I have to, there's an exit plan I need to make to move to a 30, uh, a 64 bit version of a Pi. Uh, but now I need to figure out what I want to do with a Pi 2 because sync thing was really nice. And uh, the coolest thing about that Raspberry Pi 2 was that there was a hard hardware limit on transfer. The thing couldn't handle more than. It, what is it? Eight times eight is about 64. 64 megabits per second. So that would translate to about seven megabytes per second, give or take, um, uh, with processing. Yeah, it, that's all it could handle. So you could stick it on a 100 meg uh, port, and it would still be fine because it couldn't transfer faster than that anyway. So I didn't have to worry about setting like transfer limits between the people that I'm sharing files with. Uh, the Pi itself <laughs> was just like... Yeah, sorry, man. That's my that's my top speed. Have you got a zero? Uh, I do, but I don't want to be using Wi-Fi for that. Well, you uh, you can get. I've got some of these little adapters. It's a uh, Ethernet to micro USB adapter. That's how I had mine set up. I got two of them. Yeah, and yeah. you and can that literally because the the actual physical Ethernet port on the twos and well actually the threes too are it's all, all through over the USB, USB bus. controller. Yeah. yeah, it's the fours that got away from that, right? They have their own bus now. Right. Yeah. 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 That's really everything cool. from the four forward. So you I can guess, try I that. It, I don't know. I, I have a two that's running my pie hole, and it's I have not oh, found any reason. That's what I could do with it. Yeah. 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 I mean, I haven't found any reason to update to a newer device. I mean, it it doesn't need to be any faster. It you know the throughput, especially yeah. for like Wi-Fi and stuff. It's I mean, it's to route that traffic through it. You would think maybe it'd be a bottleneck, but it's really not, not. DNS. Not yeah, really. Not DNS. Uh, those are what what you're what you're worried about with DNS is latency. That's the thing yeah. that's going to kill you the most. And if it can wake up and give you you know within you know five, ten, fifteen milliseconds, yeah, whatever, whatever. I can tell you this though, I, when they when they started really uh, going hard on the 64-bit version of Raspberry Pi OS, I switched to that on my Pi 3, which is what's running Pi Hole yeah. for me. Same. And that 64-bit on that Pi 3 really increased the performance quite a bit, mm. uh, which I wasn't sure about because of the only of the limitation in RAM, but it it, it does make a heck of a difference. Um, Do y'all guys run Ubuntu on your Pis? No. I tried it. I, I it's Raspberry fine. Pi. Yeah, I'm running Raspberry yeah. Pi. I, I must be the only guy, because the last time I brought this up, uh, I was told I was riding the Lightning. That, wow. that it was um, Ubuntu is less stable than Raspbian, or what is it now? Raspberry Pi OS. Um, mm -hmm. And while that might be true, it's never bit me before. And I run, I have three different Pis on it right now. One on, one, the Pi 2 is on sync thing, on a compatible version of Ubuntu, which is why I still run it. Uh, Pi 3, I don't think the Pi 3 is doing much of anything. It was running Git T for me for a while. And then the Pi 4 is running an RSS aggregator. And, oh, I think I moved Git T to the Pi 4. I think that's what happened. Because um, the Pi 4 was not even breaking a sweat. And those things run hot in the first place. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't see how it would make any difference, really, especially if you're just using software that's coming oh, from Debian anywhere. Anyway. It's all Docker. Yeah. yeah. So... Yeah, I don't see because I run updates. Uh, I think mine's still based on Buster, and I yeah, hardly. See, you'll get leave any. your Pi to run software a gajillion years old, but not your Docker containers. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I run the updates on the Pi all the time, but it keeps it keeps. Yeah, it's based no, in, on Buster, so you get what you get. Yeah, but in, it's in Debian, just it's, running Pi Hole. If you never ever want to see updates, man, my God, run Debian. I I I had left a VM alone for a month or two, and I I run updates and I get like six. In Ubuntu, you get a hundred 
if you wait that long. So I, I guess I do appreciate the amount of work that Ubuntu does. <laughs> It's a lot. Unless you run Sid. Yeah. And then you're going to get about as many well, as the Arch users. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, true. Uh, that's, you know, that's Fedora Rawhide, man. I've been running that a little bit to get a hold of Plasma 6 here lately. And my God, there's 100 updates a day. Yeah. Yeah. And it, Which and is you what get, you'd expect. Yeah. It it, and if you get wrapped up in one of the their rebuilds, which just happened a couple of days ago, you get a thousand. So it's crazy, man. It's crazy. Plasma 6, huh? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's quite Tell us good. a little bit about that. Uh, it's fantastic. The end. <laughs> really? So, yeah. But uh, for very specific reasons in your case. Well, uh, because I'm... Uh, because of Wayland and the automatic scaling and all the stuff that uh, you've seen. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. Uh, me and Eric in a, in a back channel, I think... Uh, can we talk about this? You could talk about this, right? I think. Okay, all right. <laughs> but uh, Eric had suggested... Uh, running a poll, but the the idea behind it was, um, c would you say is Plasma Six enough to make you consider? Yeah. It? Right. So you know, for people that have run something else for a long time, like I, I was a Plasma user for a long time, and I'll admit that as Plasma sort of sank into the five series and became more stable, it also became a little more boring. And I just sort of walked off to greener pastures in my own mind. You what know? could so, possibly so, be greener than every toggle ever? Well, come on now. Cinnamon has always <laughs> been my happy place because it's, yeah. the, it's the midpoint between Plasma and Gnome, right? Man, that it sure in my is, mind, isn't it? At least. Yeah. yeah. No, that's it why really I love is. it. That's exactly why I love it. So, but the thought crossed my mind because, of course, you know, new hotness is always like, hey, there's yeah. something new to play with. And so Plasma 6, you know, I've been same thing, Rawhide and just kind of checking it out. And, you know, they've done some nice things with just simple sort of like house cleaning. They've made the control panel a little cleaner, a little laid out, I think, a little more logically. Um, you know, I like some of the cleanup that they've done and i like the fact that they're really pushing hard on Wayland and trying to advance the state of the art of the linux desktop like these are they're, all wonderful things i just want to stop you right there they're not just advancing the state of the art they are the state plasma is even in 5.27 the state of the art desktop on top of Wayland. there is no and i full-throatedly there is no competitor to the amount of good that has come out of uh, Wayland than on Plasma. Plasma is the state of the art. It's fantastic. And that's coming from a GNOME user. Oh yeah, oh man. So and that gets us to the point that, that Leo was, was driving towards there, which is, I thought, okay, given that I've invested heavily in other desktops and I know a lot of other people have as well, does Plasma 6, turn the head does it make you you know the the meme of looking back and you know at the at the girl you just walked past yeah. you know does plasma six turn your head does it make you think hey you know maybe this is interesting enough for me to actually switch to using plasma so i don't know i'm i'm wondering if is it going to be just because it's something new is it the technical merit? Is it is it because it's new enough to get people to try it, and then they think, oh, this is actually you know much improved or a better fit now than it was, or maybe <clears throat> maybe this is the gateway into Wayland that some holdouts have been you know on the fence, and this is the what sort of gets us over that. I don't know, you know, and I really so I posed the question uh, on Linux Saloon. Um, there's always a poll. And so I had kind of said to Eris on there, and you know, hey, maybe this is a good poll. You know, is this interesting enough? Um, yes. So. So I I had um, the poll doesn't exist. It may be one day, but uh, I've already right. voted in the poll. Uh, <laughs> the answer is yes, and not just Plasma Six. So, um, so in Linux user space, uh, we just did the KDE history, uh, which was a bear. Oh my God. Um, <laughs> Uh, we did. We didn't do the live stream after that, uh, the day after the release of that, because mm -mm, burnt out. It's, mm -mm, not doing anything, and then I haven't done anything till today. So, anyway, uh, so we were using Plasma Six on Rawhide at the suggestion of uh, Neil Gompa because it was 
pretty much the only option to run Plasma 6 uh, outside of Chaos, uh, which I think Dan tried that and it kind of exploded in his face. And then um, there was, oh, KDE Neon, but you don't get the most current, I don't know if it's, f the, the base Ubuntu is not current. So even though you're getting the most latest Plasma 6, you're actually missing a ton of the underpinning stuff that makes Plasma 6 so great. So the experience is not what you would get in a rawhide. So rawhide, that was it. And uh, Plasma 6 was pretty good. Like uh, for a release candidate one, which is where I stepped on to it, um, it was quite good. There are some things that, um, like the taskbar, when I when I maximized a window, like maximize, maximize too, I have to very be very specific, not just push the little square button in the top to make it big on the screen. I mean, F11 maximize, as in it takes over the entire screen. The taskbar, yeah, the taskbar itself wouldn't move out of the way. Like you could still see it because I had transparency onto a, a, a command line console. And you could still see the taskbar back there. And I'm like, that's not right. Anyway, <laughs> after a couple of updates, like we're talking two days of updates, uh, all, of, all of my issues were fixed. It was, it was amazing. So um, I'm like, well, I don't want to run Rawhide on my desktop. So what can I get? And Fedora 39 runs uh, Plasma 5.27. Dude, it's amazing. It's am I haven't tried Plasma since the early fives which is about the time that I started peeking into Gnome. I love Cinnamon. I've, I was on that. I started peeking into Gnome. And then over the past year, I've really gotten to, to liking what Gnome has to offer uh, on the Ubuntu side. Turns out Ubuntu applies a bunch of patches to Gnome that make the Gnome desktop way more usable, and that includes a fractional scaling patch that allows you to do 125%, 150%. But the issue I kept running into is uh, if you use that patch and you have two opposite screens, one that requires scaling and one that doesn't, and you move the OBS window from one to the other, whaling crashes. The whole entire session crashes. Mm -hmm. So uh, the gnome shell, I guess I, I would say, crashes. Um, and that's not good during a live stream if you're moving stuff around or whatever. If, and it, yeah. if it even peaks over, right? Like if it has to do two scales at one time as you're dragging it over game over man uh, that would be a that would be a showstopper for me because literally when I'm because doing, the live stream has stopped yeah <laughs> and the way the way i do uh the way i do round table is i full screen the uh discord chat in the middle screen here and then i start obs over here and then i drag it over on top of that which kind of like makes it not full screen anymore for me, but mm. the window behind it is still being absorbed by OBS Studio as a, yeah. as a full screen. So if I'm moving it around and it, and it kills the session, then that, that'd be a yeah. non-starter. Yeah, my solution yeah, to that... that was, it's, I've had that problem with, with GNOME, basically just you know, the nature of the single-threaded aspects of some of the desktop and the way that, you know, if you have a big enough problem, it basically just destroys your session. And, you know, it just still seems to be problems with that all these years later. And, and I know it's just a fundamental architecture uh, problem that they haven't been able to fully squash. But that's why one of the biggest reasons that I've not used GNOME, even on Ubuntu, is because there will be those times where it'll be fine. It'll be fine for months. And then all of a sudden, that one time, especially like you're saying, you're in the middle of yeah. something really important and it just blows up in, yeah. a, in a spectacular way. Yeah, lucky yeah. for me, I, I figured that out uh, prior to going live. And my solution to that was if you unscale the window first or, or the, the screen. So I have a, it's like halfway to 4K, something like that on the framework laptop. So you got to scale it a little bit. Um, and if you just set it back to not being scaled, if both monitors are unscaled, it works. Everything works just fine. But the moment you scale it, it'll break. So I'm testing out Plasma to see if I can get around that issue. Because as far as I understand, the, the way that they do scaling is different than the way that GNOME does scaling. And it's not as hacky as the Ubuntu patch uh, that GNOME for years has not accepted. So, yeah. 
anyway, plasma is way more amazing than I ever remember it being, than, than it has uh, any right to be, to be honest, uh, on the Linux desktop. It's pretty fantastic. So maybe the sheen will wear off after a little bit, after I play with it some more, after I test that exact use case on it. But as of right now, man, like it's, it's a drop-in replacement for GNOME. Even without that feature, being able to do that, it's already a good replacement for GNOME. So what do I do, man? Go with and, it. Yeah. Yeah, you know? just yeah. go Because I want it. Wayland. That, that's why I can't use Cinnamon right now, um, because I am doing scaling. And Cinnamon, it'll right. scale, but... Ooh, sometimes it and on X, by the way, uh, but sometimes it will. Ooh, uh, like the desktop will flicker, the windows will flicker, the drag and drag and drop stuff just does sort of work sometimes and sort of doesn't other times. There's enough rough edges that uh, I just don't bother. Uh, so I've been on KDE or Plasma and GNOME. Yeah, it's, it is conditional. While. I mean, for me at least, on this laptop that I use as my main system. Cinnamon just works well because it's a single screen. There's right. no real kind of like scaling or anything happening. Um, but I definitely on other systems or multi-monitor or anything where you have disparate, you know, scaling. Like it, Plasma just, you know, I think you can kind of look at it like, yes, the strong point of Plasma has always been configurability and customization. But now it's really becoming as much about the underlying capabilities of how it's handling really sort of key core things like how is it dealing with displays and um, scaling and dealing with newer technologies and like it it's separating itself in a different way in my mind it, it's going beyond just you know oh I can move something here or change that you know setting on the desktop like it, the, 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 the technology itself is fundamentally you know, outpacing other things. Um, so that's really, when I look at it now, yes. I mean, I still see some of the rough edges and I still see some of the things I didn't like previously, um, but I do see that they are moving in a direction, right? They're, yeah. they're making progress and they're um, really good at what it's going to come down to. I've had, you mentioned this uh, on Linux user space about, if you mess with the panel or you mess with things oh a little God. too much, yeah. stuff just it. blows up. Yeah. And and I've always had that same problem and I've never quite understood why it was such a problem for me and not for other people. And and I'm not oh, saying yeah. like like I agree with you. I would report the bug if I knew which ten steps I took yeah. or twenty or however many. But ultimately I think it's that um, I, I don't feel like I've made drastic changes and I've still had some problems. And I would like to be able to put the bar on the top and use a dock or a launcher or, you know, there are some desktop paradigms I'd like to try to produce, reproduce in, in Plasma, but I always feel like, <clears throat> excuse me, I always feel like it's fragile. And I'm hoping that that's something that they overcome, because if I can get around that, I think that I'll be pretty happy using Plasma. And this, yeah. the, I think this is my my next opportunity to, to come back and try it again uh, and really sort of hopefully be able to contribute if I find something, you know, maybe I can figure out why. <laughs> Fedora 40. Why breaks. Um, yeah, little, yeah. A little birdie told me uh, that uh, the next Ubuntu is not going to ship Fedora 40 or uh, uh, Plasma 6. So we're going to have to wait another Ubuntu cycle if you want to get onto an Ubuntu to do that. Um, so yeah, Fedora 40 uh, or Arch, I, I suppose, uh, will be your only options when it comes to something like that. But um, I suppose Arch... kind of makes sense that it wouldn't be on Kubuntu right away because well, that's the, the release really, casing. Yeah, because they, it's going to come out late February, and then uh, Kubuntu is going to release early April. That's a lot of testing to get done in a very yeah. short amount of time that prob I mean it's just not I think the freeze is in January so uh, or at least the first freeze or something like early I don't know the fir the freeze happens before plasma 6 drops so if you do the math you don't need a little birdies to tell you that that wasn't going to happen no 
Although, if it shows up in the backports repository. And, they, and it will, because Kubuntu right. is, is famously excellent at backporting. Yeah. Yeah, but, 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 but the whole entire problem with running uh, Plasma anything on an Ubuntu is that everything gets crufty eventually. So unless yeah. you're yeah. staying on those six-month releases, you're missing out on a whole lot of fixes that didn't happen in Ubuntu that happened everywhere else. Yeah. So it, it's a bit of a risk to run... Uh, risk is too much of a word. Um, you're you're going to have a slightly worse experience in Ubuntu uh, on Plasma than you would most anywhere else unless, you know, unless those issues are, ooh, we updated it, and uh, that's actually broken, so we'll revert that and fix it. <laughs> yeah. So you're safe from those. Well, yeah. that pretty much winds it up for us. Got to get going. It's getting close to 3 o'clock. Let us know what you think, dear listener, dear watcher. Uh, like and subscribe to YouTube. Get a hold of us, uh, show at linuxotc.org. We're on a couple of socials, uh, Mastodon, Discord. Uh, but, yeah, email. Oh, you can comment directly on the website, too. A couple people have used that. Um, we'd love to hear from you. Let us know what you think about the stuff we talk about. Give us ideas of stuff to talk about. Um, but for crying out loud, let us know something. We'd love to hear from you. Anyway, we'll be back in two weeks. Until then, I've been Bill. I've been Eric. And I'm still Leo. Still Leo. See you, folks.